Good evening, everyone. This is Jane Beeman, and I'm the Global Director of Professional Relations for Euclid. And I would like to thank you for spending your time this evening uh, with us. We have a wonderful program and a wonderful speaker for you tonight. So uh, again, thank you for taking your valuable time and spending it uh, here with us. Now, before we get very far, let me tell you that this presentation, of course, uh, belongs to our presenter, uh, Dr. McClure. And the use of, uh, her use of contact lens products is, is certainly uh, her use as a licensed eye care doctor. It may not uh, reflect exactly the FDA definition for orthokeratology or the specific approval and use of our Euclid products, but as an independent practitioner, uh, she has uh, those effects. All right, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. McClure. Dr. McClure completed her undergraduate degree at The Ohio State University. She continued their post-grad uh, education after receiving her Doctor of Optometry and graduated magna cum laude in 2016. She continued her education at, with an advanced practice fellowship in cornea and contact lenses, achieved a master's degree in vision science. Along with practicing at the Professional Vision Care in Columbus, Ohio uh, private practice, Dr. McClure serves on faculty at The Ohio State University as a clinical assistant professor and also conducts contact lens research at Ohio State. Dr. McClure specializes in orthokeratology fitting and contact lens conditions such as dry eye, keratoconus, high astigmatism, and presbyopia. So uh, I've been pleased to know Dr. McClure for several years now, and I'm very pleased to have her speaking for us tonight. I think you're going to learn a lot and enjoy her uh, quite a bit. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much, Jane, for that introduction, and thank you for having me. I'm really excited to present to you all tonight effective strategies for presenting ortho-K to parents and patients. Most often, communication about ortho-K and myopia management is the biggest challenge. I find that the lens fitting, reading topography, and clinical management often comes easy. However, educating parents and patients can pose many challenges. Every office is unique with varying patient demographics, but my hope is that you can find this information useful and applicable to your clinic. Here are our learning objectives for the evening. So my goal is that you will feel prepared to create a set of office protocols and policies that will help staff and patients alike understand what is expected. Following a set of standard office procedures will allow staff to feel confident in what is expected of their roles in your clinic, and this will facilitate an organized myopia management and ortho -K clinic. Much of our discussion tonight will focus on creating these office policies. In turn, this will allow you to have a consistent message throughout your entire office. I will also outline techniques for educating patients and parents on myopia and ortho -K in terms that they will relate to and understand, which is really important. Throughout the lecture, we will discuss ways in which you can instill confidence and trust with your families by listening to their concerns and how you can manage these concerns efficiently in a busy clinical setting. So discussing myopia management, when do we want to approach this concept? And you want to approach the concept during the comprehensive eye exam. You may find that the child is newly nearsighted or that the child's uh, myopia has progressed. However, you do not have time to appropriately discuss all treatment options during the comprehensive eye exam. It's really important that you allot time for this discussion. You want to build trust with the parents and the patients. And the best way to build trust is by allotting the appropriate time to thoroughly educate on myopia and answer all of their questions. By setting aside this dedicated time, 
you will avoid confusion, frustrations, and misunderstandings. So I encourage you to schedule your patients for a myopia management consultation. You want to make sure that you charge appropriately for your time. We won't specifically discuss um, fees and or billing and coding tonight, but I do want to point out that you should charge for your services appropriately. However, your parents and patients who are motivated will definitely return. During the comprehensive eye exam, you want to emphasize the need to address this myopia. Parents desire to seek out what is best for their child, so if you've emphasized the importance, they will return for this consultation appointment. So let's look a little bit more at that consultation appointment. What should we accomplish during this exam? So I've outlined some things that we'd like to do. We want to provide education on myopia and the therapies. We want to set expectations, then initiate a therapy, and it also gives you the opportunity to complete all necessary testing and measurements. So let's look at some of these specifics. First and foremost, this is an opportunity to provide education on myopia and the therapies. So let's look at that. So what is myopia? How do we explain this to parents and to their children? The challenge is educating on the progression and the risk factors. And likely this education will vary depending on the parent's own experience. That's how you wanna guide your conversation. So a critical question to ask the parents is, are you nearsighted? This will help you understand a couple of things. It will help you understand the child's risk for progression, which we know is really important, but it will also allow you to assess the baseline understanding that the family may or may not have. So I find that the education is different, maybe depending on the parent's refractive error and their baseline knowledge. My myopic parents, you know, they may understand the struggle of the worsening eyesight, their prescription constantly changing, not being able to see in the back of the classroom, and they also may have experience with contact lens wear, both positive and negative. So this may influence some of their decisions and influence some of the treatments they decide to pursue for their children. However, emotropic parents, they have less experience, they don't know what it's like not to be able to see or to have to rely on glasses and contact lenses. However, they also have less bias if they've never worn contact lenses. Sometimes I find that emotropic parents are enthusiastic about ortho K for their child because their child can see clearly without glasses or contact lenses during the day, much like they do. So it's something they can relate to. On the other hand, sometimes myopic parents bias towards soft contact lens wear because that's what they have experience wearing. That's what they're familiar with. Now, this isn't always true, but just some anecdotal observations is that sometimes the emotropic parents may bias towards ortho K, whereas myopic parents may feel more comfortable with the tight lens type that they're more familiar with. So if you know this background information about the parents, it can help guide and direct your conversation. You wanna make sure that you highlight the risks associated with high myopia. However, I like to avoid using scare tactics. And what I mean by that is you don't want to tell the parents that the child will go blind or develop glaucoma. On the other hand, what I like to do is highlight the risks and and show them that we want to prevent high myopia. So we want to emphasize that we are slowing the myopia progression to prevent high myopia and therefore decreasing the risk of glaucoma, cataracts, and retinal detachments. We also want to provide a risk analysis and I'll provide you some information about how you can do this. So there's a couple different tools available that parents can use to better understand their child's risks. And here's one, it's mykidsvision.org. And I think that this is a really nice resource for parents so they can better understand their child's risk factors for myopia. 
parents really appreciate resources like this one because it's written in a language that they can understand and relate to. And from the Euclid website, we have a myopia risk checklist, which is another helpful tool for parents to better understand the risk factors once again. You also want the parents to understand the potential for the myopia progression. And there's a couple different calculators available to do this. So this myopia calculator is from the Brian Holden Vision Institute. And this one allows you to input patient demographics such as ethnicity, age, and refractive error. And then you can simulate the potential for progression both with and without the myopia management therapies. So I think this is a really nice visual tool showing how you can potentially slow the progression. These tools, both the risk assessment and the myopia calculator, provide great opportunities also to include your staff members. Your patients can have a pre-consultation workup with one of your staff members, and they can help facilitate the administration of these tools, which can be really useful. So that way, when your, par when your parents and patients come to your um, your consultation appointment, they already have some baseline information. Your staff member has already gone through a couple risk assessments so the parents understand the risk for progression. And then maybe your staff member goes ahead and, and puts in the information in this calculator so that you can simulate this during your evaluation, which can also be really helpful. So we've provided education on myopia and the management therapies. Next, we want to set expectations. So let's discuss ways in which we can outline these expectations for the parents. We want to aim to slow the progression of the nearsightedness. And I like to make this very clear to my parents. We aren't going to stop it. We aren't going to reverse it. We just want to slow the progression. And that's the first expectation that I like to set. Then, as we all know, not all treatment options are appropriate for each patient, but the parents may have preconceived ideas based on the treatments their child's uh, friends and or family members may be receiving. And I run into this quite frequently. So I like to set the expectation very early on in the consultation appointment that we are creating a customized treatment plan that is appropriate for their child specifically. Then we want to outline that they need continued care and close monitoring. So the parents need to be informed that there will be follow-up visits. I personally find it really helpful to pre-appoint these visits. This way, they have a clear understanding of when they will be expected to return to your clinic. What you want to avoid is having the parents, you know, call into your office to schedule the appointment. Many families are very busy, and then the child is often lost to follow up because the parents forget to call in. So if you pre-appoint the future appointments, they will have clear expectations of the time commitment and when they need to be back in your office. I also like to instill confidence in our plan for the child, but I also want to inform the parents on the potential for adjunctive therapy or for modifications. So I like to choose my words very carefully when I explain this to the parent. I'll often say something like, we have chosen this therapy because we feel confident that it is best for your child. We will monitor closely for the intended results. Each child is different, and if the results do not meet expectations, we will work together to modify your child's therapy. So in that conversation, I'm both instilling confidence in the treatment we have chosen, but letting them know we may modify it as we go along. Then I like to open up the conversation and allow the parents and the child to express their concerns 
or their expectations of their treatment as well. So after we've provided education and set the expectations, we can now begin to initiate a therapy. So let's talk about some techniques in which we can do that. What I think is really useful is creating a guide or a handout. This can be printed or electronic. And what you wanna do is provide an overview of myopia and what it is and the myopia management options. You want to outline the treatment options that you provide. And if there's some you don't, where the parent can potentially find those. You can consider providing this guide prior to the consultation appointment so the parents have some background information. Then they will have a really nice general understanding of what therapy options you will potentially be prescribing. So once again, you've set that expectation even before they come to the consultation appointment about what you might be discussing. And this guide can either, like you said, be electronic or a printed handout. The benefit of electronic guide is that you can provide further links and information and more education. So it can be a little bit more interactive and a lot of parents really appreciate that. And you can also include some links um, for some videos for the children as well. Now, you may want to consider including your fee structure um, on this guide. However, if doing so, I'm going to recommend that you provide this at the consultation appointment and not prior. I prefer personally to avoid directing the conversation with fees. So I find it most effective if you first thoroughly educate so the parents understand the importance prior to the fee discussion. And if you're going to include fees, what you need to include are your contact lens professional and material fees, potentially your, the atropine fees, and then all the appointment fee follow-ups as well. And this really gives parents the opportunity to discuss and consider the options. I find this really helpful if not all parents are present. So if you give them a guide, something they can um, take home or, or an electronic version that you can email them, um, it's a way that the parents can have a conversation and it can guide the conversation at home. Um, I find it a little frustrating when you have one parent um, that brings a child into the exam and you do all the discussion and there's a really good understanding and then that parent goes home and you get a call from the other parent who's confused and frustrated because they don't understand what was discussed. So if you provide some tangible information for the parents, um, they can have a discussion at home and once again, prevent any confusion. So next, we have all these therapies. How do we navigate and prescribe what is appropriate for the child? And most importantly, how do we have these conversations with the parent? You know, we have all the different therapies. We have the bifocal or defocus glasses, low dose atropine, multifocal soft contact lenses, orthokeratology, or even a combination of therapies. So there's a lot to discuss. So that's why the consultation appointment is so helpful because it can allow you to gauge the child's motivation and maturity for contact lens wear or the willingness to use eye drops. So let's look a little bit more about how we're going to initiate the therapy and have this conversation. Early on in the consultation appointment or potentially even prior, I like to ask the child a really open-ended question. Have you thought about wearing contact lenses? This will allow me to gauge their interest and motivation. Staff can also inquire about the potential for contact lens wear during that pre-consultation workup if you haven't had the chance to ask maybe during the comprehensive exam. By gauging the child's motivation for contact lens wear early on, this will really help you narrow down your potential treatment options and more efficiently direct your conversation during that consultation appointment. So just some other considerations for contact lens wear. You know, like I said, is the child even interested in contact lens wear? 
And if they are, do they want to wear the contact lenses part time or wear the contact lenses instead of their glasses? So another question I like to ask is, what do you want to wear contact lenses for? Now we need to know, is the patient even a good candidate for ortho -K? Then, you know, the child's interest in activities can also play a role. We know that children that are really involved in activities and sports, um, particularly swimming is a good one, um, are great candidates for ortho -K because they're not wearing their contact lenses while doing their activities. Then once again, gauging the parent's experience with contact lens wear, because that can definitely create some bias. And most importantly, I want you to know, you know the child's motivation. Motivation is key for contact lens wear and for ortho -K. We want the child to take initiative and be responsible, so we need to know just how motivated that child is. So once you have gauged the child's motivation for contact lens wear and ortho -K, you can then begin to prescribe a therapy. And I'd like to avoid what I call menu selection. And that's parents just choosing a therapy based on cost. We don't want that. Once again, we really like to avoid cost directing the conversation. And ultimately, parents are seeking your professional expertise. So you want to make it clear that you are prescribing a therapy intended for that child. I also like to emphasize that we are creating this customized treatment plan. My goal is always to prescribe a therapy early on in the appointment, ideally within the first half of the consultation appointment. This will allow you sufficient time to further discuss that prescribed therapy. There's a lot to discuss with atropine and ortho K in particular, so it's nice if you have some time to do that. That's why it's really, really important to invest time in the consultation appointment. It will allow you to be much more efficient with your future appointments. And we know parents often have many questions. So now we're going to shift our focus a little more about um, communication regarding ortho -K. And ortho -K may be an unfamiliar concept for some of your families, so you need to be prepared with additional information. You want to provide either a separate guide that you've created about ortho -K or have resources readily available. And I've listed a few here that you can use. The GP Lens Institute, GPLI, has a really great resource to provide to parents that clearly explains ortho -K. And there's a couple different ways you can get this. Um, I've attached um, the PDF version here. So this link um, has the PDF that you can print off or email patients. And then if you're in the US, you can also get free printed materials sent to your office, which can be really helpful. And then the Euclid website also provides great introductory information for families. So these resources can really help you start the conversation with ortho -K, and you don't need to start from scratch. You know, there's these guides available, there's resources available, so you can provide these to families um, to, help, to help guide and, and explain ortho -K, which can sometimes be challenging. So let's talk a little bit more about that consultation appointment. Prior to beginning the consultation appointment, you should have your staff acquire the necessary measurements. So that's going to include your topography, your HVID, um, pupil size is another one I like to do, and any other measurements um, you think you might need for your, your specific ortho -K lens. And this will also let you know if the, the patient is an appropriate candidate prior to beginning the discussion. So that's really important. Um, even before you get, begin your consultation appointment, you should have all the information you need to know whether or not you can even talk about ortho -K with this patient. What I like to do is emphasize the customized testing and lens design. So I'll often say something like, we took a very specialized measurement called topography that maps out the shape of the front of the eye where you place your contact lens. This specialized measurement will allow us to design a customized lens just for you and the shape of your eye. 
we will also use a special mapping to track your achievement progress. So using language like that will really help the child and the parent see the value in your testing skills and the product that they receive. Then I find it useful to schedule all future appointments. Once again, I like to pre-appoint as many appointments as I can. So that's often going to include the dispensing, the one day, and the one week appointment. This ensures a couple of things, that both you and the family have time in their schedules. This avoids overbooking for your schedule and running into any conflicts with the family. So what I've run into is that the child's all excited about OrthoK, I order the lens, have a dispensing appointment, and then realize I don't have a one-day follow-up, a one-week follow-up scheduled, and my appointment book is already booked. So if you go ahead and at the consultation appointment, schedule all these appointments, you're more likely to have, have time in your schedule and not have to work the patient in on top of an already full schedule. And also, families are busy. They have a lot going on. So it's frustrating when you initiate an ortho -K fit only to find that at the one week appointment, they're gonna be out of town on vacation or at a sporting tournament. So if you set these appointments before you even begin, once again, there's a clear expectation of the time that they'll be expected to be in the office, and we can make sure that everybody has that dedicated time. So after you've discussed, um, discussed all of these points, you wanna communicate the policies and fees, and I'm going to give you some ways in which you can do that. You want to make sure that you're transparent and consistent with your policies for OrthoK. And in order to do this, you need to create a patient agreement and informed consent. And then I personally like to require a signature. So your parents are gonna have lots of questions. They're going to question, you know, what happens if my child loses or breaks their lens? What happens if they can't adapt and they want to discontinue? How long do these fitting fees covered? And then will I have to pay this fee every year? So if you create a clear and comprehensive patient agreement, it will allow you to outline answers to all these potential questions before you even get started. So you can create this agreement several different ways. You could do it as an FAQ style, where you have outlined questions and answers, or you can create a more traditional document um, with different categories outlining your policies. So once again, you want to emphasize the customized treatment plan and OrthoK lens design. It's important that you've outlined the benefits of OrthoK and the customization prior to talking about fees. This will help the parents see the value in their investment, which can be beneficial so you don't dissuade them with the fee and policy discussion. Oftentimes, I think that's where, what we're afraid of. It's difficult to talk about all these policies and fees because we want this to sound like a positive and exciting thing, and it is. So if you've already emphasized that, it makes the fee discussion much easier. Also, hopefully, the child is enthusiastic and willing to put forth their time and take responsibility for their lenses as well. So next, let's go into a little bit more detail about how we create this patient agreement. And there's a couple of things that I think it should include. Your professional and material fees, your cancellation policy, patient responsibilities, and an informed consent. All right, so professional fees. What do your professional fees cover? Um, in your OrthoK agreement, you need to clearly outline this. So this will likely include the duration and the services that are covered. So the duration for me in my clinic includes the treatment um, one year from the date the document is signed. I think that's pretty standard for most clinics, but you may have something different. 
And then the services I provide, um, I've just outlined a couple of things here that you might want to include. Um, the initial ortho K evaluation and dispensing appointment, the one day, one week, one month appointment, and then oftentimes you're going to have a three or six month evaluation um, or both depending on your practice preferences. And then any additional follow up visits is necessary. And then I like to include this emergency visits related to any ortho K complications. So I like to ensure the parents that although complications from ortho K are infrequent, should problems arise, we will be available to address any issues or concerns. So material fees, I think this is a little bit more challenging sometimes to, to communicate. So what's included and what's the warranty policy? So what's included um, for me and my fees, that's the, the initial pair of lenses. And then the warranty policy. That's going to vary depending on the agreements you have with your ortho K lab. So I'll just outline the one that I have here. The warranty policy is 90 days from the date the lens is initially ordered. And I think that's important to point out because we don't want the parents, you know, waiting, waiting two months to schedule the dispensing appointment. Once again, we want this to happen all efficiently. So they need to know it's 90 days from the date the lens is ordered. And then the big question, well, what does this cover? It's going to cover a damaged or broken lens. And I also let them know that they must provide um, that damaged lens. I want the parents to know that if the lens breaks, they should not dispose of it. Rather, save the lens, take a picture, and submit it for um, a replacement lens. So I have a way in which the parents can, can email me that photo, and then immediately I can get their new lens ordered. I also like to let the parents know that if we need to make modifications to the lens design, there will not be additional cost. So sometimes I get uh, questions from parents like, well, what happens if you have to make changes? Well, we have to pay for new lenses. And I like to tell them, if we need to make modifications to your lens or treatment to further customize your results, this is covered under your initial fee within 90 days. And once again, I'm emphasizing the value of our products and services. Um, so that's the warranty policy that I follow. Yours may be a little different, um, but that's how I outline it for, for parents. And just to be explicitly clear, because I've had problems with this in the past, um, it does not cover a lost lens. So I think this is important to point out. If the child is still working on perfecting their insertion and removal technique, I like to let parents know they really cannot lose this lens. So they may need to put a towel down, um, they need to practice over a big surface, and if they think they dropped the lens, they definitely uh, need, to, to need to look for it. I also like to directly state the commitment to the therapy and the importance of avoiding any disruptions to the treatment. So therefore, I personally encourage a spare pair of lenses. What I want to avoid is the child losing or breaking a lens and then stress to the parents how important a backup pair is. I really like to be proactive instead of reactive. So I like to make them aware of this before it becomes an issue. Um, really, I found the importance of having this really detailed warranty policy in writing um, when I was initially starting to fit ortho K. So oftentimes, you know, I would, I would state this policy verbally to the parents um, in the initial process, and they always seem to understand. But then I had a child break a lens nine months after my initial fit, and the mother kind of put up a fuss because she assumed it was covered. She thought that the warranty policy for the contact lenses was the same as the glasses frame, and since that's a year, she thought the warranty policy for the lens was a year. So because I've had some misunderstandings, I wanted to make sure that I, I clearly outlined this um, in writing for, for parents. 
So that backup pair, let's go back to that. Um, one way that parents can be prepared um, is by encouraging an initial backup pair. And I do provide a backup pair discount, which I think can be beneficial. And you know, this is especially true for your new ortho K wearers. Oftentimes your established ortho K patients who have been wearing lenses for a number of years, they likely have at least one or maybe multiple backup pairs. However, your new wearers will need to purchase a spare pair in order to avoid any treatment disruptions. So personally, I allow the parents to purchase a spare pair at a discount um, if they're within their 90 day warranty period, but their fit is finalized. So let's say at that one month of visit, I, I say, great, this is working really well. Um, we'll still continue to follow up, but as far as I'm concerned, you know, the, the contact lens fitting process is finalized. I'll let them go ahead and, and purchase a spare pair at that time. Now, next question you're gonna get from parents is, well, you talked about this initial cost. Will I have to pay this every year? Or um, what cost will I incur every year? So for, for me, um, I let them know that in addition to their comprehensive exam fees, there will also be a certain fee for ortho K annually. And I wanna let them know that they'll need both. They'll need their comprehensive exam and they'll need their ortho K evaluation, including the topography, contact lens um, fitting and, and vision evaluation. And this can be either with your comprehensive exam if you feel you have time, um, depending on how you run your schedule, or you can schedule them separately. And oftentimes you will schedule a six month assessment as well. So, you know, parents who are unfamiliar with gas perm lenses will often ask, you know, how long are the lenses good for? How long do the lenses last? So you'll need to explain that the lenses should be replaced annually um, at a certain cost per lens. So this is also information that I like to include in the agreement so that they have an understanding. All right, let's talk a little bit about a cancellation policy. So what if the child doesn't adapt? You're definitely going to get that question from parents. Um, I almost always get that question. I know a cancellation policy is of somewhat of a debate. Some providers feel you should never refund professional fees, and that's fine if that's your feeling. Um, personally, I do feel like this is an exception for me. Uh, providing a cancellation policy, I think has actually helped to, to boost my ortho K practice. So I was finding that some parents were hesitant to, to start ortho K because it was slightly unfamiliar to them and they were really afraid that their child couldn't do it and couldn't adapt. So they went with what they felt like was the safer option, which was a soft contact lens fitting. I think mostly because that's what they're more familiar with. Even though I would encourage, you know, that the child would adapt and that the child would do well, sometimes they would go with the soft contact lenses, I think just um, from a familiarity standpoint. So if there's a refund, I think the, the parents might be a little bit um, more excited and a little less hesitant about the adaptation. So um, I do provide um, a refund and it's different if it's within 30 days or after 30 days. However, um, there's a big disclaimer here. You must appropriately select patients and set those expectations for ortho K if you're going to provide a cancellation policy. So there have been patients that I've told no to for ortho K because their prescription was borderline or I didn't think the child was quite ready. So I'm very selective and very careful about who I choose for for ortho K, and I always set those expectations. And I would say um, that in the last two years, I can think of maybe one or two patients that I've actually had to, um, to refund. And really what you can do is instead of refunding, you can apply those funds um, towards an alternative uh, myopia management therapy. So you can handle that however you like in your clinic, um, but I have actually found that to be very successful for me and my practice. So there's um, the patient responsibilities, and I think this is pretty straightforward, but it's useful to have in the document that you have signed. 
Um, this is just some examples of what you might want to include. So obviously the patient should attend all scheduled appointments, use only the prescribed lens care system, comply with the wearing schedule, and report all treatment um, related emergencies immediately. And this allows you to have a conversation with the child. So I'll often say something like, you know, we want to make sure that um, you're coming to all your appointments and you're using only um, the cleaning systems that we want you to. So this gives you an opportunity to allow the child to be responsible for their care as well. And then your informed consent. Um, this is just some ideas to get you started. Um, you definitely want to make this your own and maybe include a few others. Um, but some, some, some points that I like to include are that they will experience altered vision through their current glasses or contact lenses. So those will no longer work for them. That the therapeutic effect will decrease if the lenses are not worn every day. Um, that's often a misconception, so parents will come in thinking that after the child wears the ortho-K for a year, that they'll be free forever from glasses and contact lenses. So once again, I like to have this in the agreement that they must wear it every day, um, otherwise it won't be effective. And also in the U.S., this is off-label for myopia management, so I do include that in my informed consent. Um, I really haven't had um, too many parents question that. Um, they seem to be okay with that um, personally in my practice. And then I think it's important to provide your contact information. So you can provide your office phone number and I think it's really important that you provide on-call services as well, since you have children that are sleeping in their contact lenses. And I like to make sure the parents know how to reach the on-call services um, if needed. All right, so um, now we've initiated our ortho -K fit. How do we explain these outcomes? So consistent wear and patience. I like to explain that the vision will be blurry for the first one to two weeks and they will still need their glasses at that time. Especially during the first week, they're going to want to take their glasses to school because their vision will be blurry towards the end of the day. And it's also helpful, once again, if you appropriately time this, you don't want to schedule the initial fit um, in the middle of the child's exam week or during a sporting tournament because then they will be really frustrated. Um, so you need to make sure it's you know, a couple of weeks in which they can adapt to the vision. And then I like to be really enthusiastic about their day one and week one results. So I'll say, look, we've corrected half of your prescription or we've corrected a third of your prescription. And then what I'll do is I'll show them their, their smell and acuity, um, previously uncorrected, versus their ortho K results. So I'll pull up the eye chart and say, look, um, normally you can only see these big letters without your glasses and contact lenses. And today you can see all these small letters. Um, so if they can read um, all the letters on this Buckeye eye chart I have here, they are good to go. <laughs> um, another thing I like to do is, is have them look at the topography. I think that provides a really great visual for, for the patients and the parents. The patients get really excited about the, the cool colors on the topography. So what I'll do is I'll bring up their topography image um, before they started Ortho-K and I'll say, see here, look at this. This is your eye before you started. Um, this is a special mapping we took of your eye before we started um, your Ortho-K. And then here's the special mapping today. And I'll say, do you see this little red ring? That's where your lenses are treating. That's where the treatment is on the, on the front surface of your eye. And the kids get really excited about that because usually those two um, topographies are going to look really different and they can appreciate seeing the, the, the red ring form on the topography. And I even had one child get so excited about looking at, at the topography images that he asked if he could use them for his science fair experiment. Um, so I'm not really sure how that went, but he thought that that was, that was really cool. So I have to talk about cleaning and care. Upon the in initial consultation, I like to stress the safety of ortho -K. So I like to tell parents the lenses are manufactured from a really breathable material. And they seem to really resonate with that word. That will be even more true with some of our new hyper DK materials. So I'm really excited about that um, and, and getting parents excited about these new materials potentially. 
we also want to make sure they're using proper solutions and it's important that you provide a starter kit. I personally prefer um, peroxide based solutions, but I do provide a GP multi purpose solution, which is useful when they're doing INR. So that way the child has something that they can uh, clean their lenses with should they drop it, or if they feel like there's something underneath their lens, they know what to use and they have everything that they need. At the initial dispensing appointment, I personally provide education on proper cleaning and care of the lenses. Certainly you can utilize staff members to review the process in more detail, but I think it's critical that they hear this from the doctor. This really helps to emphasize the importance. You want to make sure that you review cleaning and care every time you, the patient is in the office. So I encourage the patient to bring all supplies to their follow-up appointments so we can make sure that they're using the correct cleaning and disinfecting products. Um, if you ask your, your patients to bring in everything they're using, sometimes you might be surprised um, what's in their little ortho K bag. So it's really important that they bring everything that they use with their lenses in. I also provide samples of lubricating drops and instruct them on, on how to use. So I like the patients to use a thicker lubricating drop inside the lens um, prior to insertion at night. I find that this greatly helps with comfort and adaptation, and it actually optimizes the results. And then what I will tell the, the parents is that they want to keep that a box that the artificial tear comes in so that when they go to purchase, when they go to the store, they know exactly what to get. That way they're getting the appropriate supplies. So you've created um, a standard patient agreement and office policies. So this will help your staff feel more prepared to answer questions, and that will help you create your consistent message throughout your entire office. I think it's also helpful to have staff in the exam room for the visits. So this will allow them to experience the process. And if you're just getting started with Ortho-K in your clinic, you can even fit um, a staff member if it's appropriate or maybe their child so that they can really see um, how, how Ortho-K works. And then they can get excited and talk to your patients about it. So um, just some last thoughts as we kind of wrap up with the last few slides here. Um, you know, telehealth has become more popular in optometry recently, and currently it may be difficult for some families to leave their homes and come into the office. So you may want to consider a three-month or six-month um, telehealth follow-up, and there's methods um, and ways you can check visual acuity actually via telehealth. Um, so this would allow you to screen for problems and determine if an office visit is warranted. So if you do a telehealth three month, six month follow up, the child's eyes not red, the child's comfortable, doing well, wearing the lenses every night, visual acuity is good. They probably don't need to actually physically at this time come into the office for the three month. Obviously we would prefer them do so, um, but there are certainly circumstances that are um, out of our control currently. I like to stress consistently, consistency with treatment and that they must wear the lenses every night. So recently in the media, certainly there was some debate about contact lens wear and is it safe? And we know that it is safe using proper hygiene, hand washing, and lens care. So I do want to stress that the child should remain in their treatment and, and continue a schedule. I like to go above and beyond to be available for patients. So oftentimes I will provide my email um, should they need it, but I make sure I tell them if they have any immediate concerns or emergencies they need to call the office. My email is just for questions that I can answer um, at my leisure. And just some other thoughts. You know, I know some practices feel leery of initiating ortho K at the time, um, kind of hesitant to do INR and be that close to a patient. And I can certainly understand that concern. However, you know, I feel that, that patients really get ortho K um, insertion removal quite easily. Most of the time, I find it more simple for my patients than soft contact lens insertion and removal. 
And I think you can easily demonstrate this in office with the patient and then allow them to practice um, from a safe distance. And typically the kids catch on, like I said, pretty quickly. Another alternative, you could provide um, some videos. You or, or your staff members could create little mini, mini videos for them to watch on insertion and removal. You do a quick demonstration and then let them practice um, while you stand a safe distance away. So at this time, you know, I feel like you can still initiate um, ortho K and there is safe ways that you can do so. And also, you know, another thought is that families may have more time to commit to ortho K and adapt to the vision. Unfortunately, um, vacations, sporting events, and camps, um, many of those have been canceled. So, you know, really this allows you the unique opportunity to work with patients and initiate ortho K when they may not have had the time that they had before. Um, so you can handle this however your office feels comfortable, and I think it certainly depends on the demographics and where you are in the U.S., um, but now may be a great time to actually start to begin ortho-K because families have a little bit more time for adaptation. So thanks again for being here, everyone. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your evening. Um, my hope is that you feel more prepared and confident and educating your, your patients and their families on ortho-K and myopia. And here's my contact information. Um, feel free to send me an email if you have any questions. And um, thank you, you, Euclid, so much for having me this evening. I was really excited to be here. Thank you and so much, Dr. McClure. You're welcome. We have quite a few questions for you, and the, I was sure. reading through them. They're quite interesting. So let's spend <laughs> a few minutes and try to answer as many of these questions as we can. Okay. Uh, First is for a child, what therapy has the best outcome in keeping the prescription to the lowest dioptric outcome? Ortho K, it says contact lenses, I'm assuming that means soft lenses, glasses, or atropine. Assuming these patients' parents are in the minus four to minus five range. So if you've got myopic parents that are already in that danger zone, where do you go first, Kate? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, certainly, we always want the treatment that's the, the best and most effective for the child. Um, and, you know, there's different literature out there, um, and it, it depends on, you know, what's maybe potentially what soft multifocal um, lens you're using, what dosage of atropine you're using. So, you know, I think there's still a lot of research on, you know, what's most effective. Um, but really, the only treatment that's effective is the one the child will do. So, I think it's really important to understand, you know, the, the parent and patient concerns, understand their motivation, because if the child won't do the treatment, it's going to be ineffective. So if the child won't do drops, they're not going to work. Um, if the child won't wear contact lenses, that's not going to work either. So I really think that, um, yes, we always want, you know, clinically what's best, um, you know, research, you know, what, what's, what's the best newest research. Yes, that's great. But in the end, you really have to tailor this treatment to the child. And I think that's kind of my overarching goal with this presentation is that it sets you up with questions to ask because that's what we really want. We want them to commit to the treatment. We want them to be successful with it. So that's what it's really all about. Um, and each child is different. So um, that's, that's kind of my experience is that um, I really want to do what's, what's best for the family. Okay, the next uh, uh, asks the average cost that doctors in the U.S. charge to your patients or provide them mail order or go have them pick it up at a pharmacy and pay the pharmacy directly. Um, you said I, you cut out, Jane, you said atropine, correct? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, yes yeah. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, so, yep, it's going to uh, depend on, on, I think, where you are in the U.S. Um, for atropine, I'm here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, we prescribe it through a compounding pharmacy. So we have a compounding pharmacy here in Columbus that actually can, um, can make the low-dose atropine, which is fantastic. So my patients can actually go pick it up directly from a pharmacy, or they can easily have it mailed to them. Um, so that's my personal experience. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have really easy access to that here. Um, I think it definitely depends on your, on, your, on your demographics and where you are. Now, here's a question I hear a lot around the world, Kate. Can, mm -hmm. can we do orthokeratology if we do not have a topographer? Ah, How do you that's feel a great, about that? 
Yeah, that's a great question, Jane. And you know what? I'm going to I'm going to argue no that that you really can't. Um in my mind, the topography is the most valuable tool you have. Sure, you can look at the lens on the eye, you can look at the fluorescein pattern. Okay. Um but that's telling you what the lens looks like on an open eye in a slit lamp. That's not telling you what happens overnight. The topography tells you that. Um so I, I really think that a, to appropriately manage your ortho K patients, you do need topography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, my answer is you can fit them with the first lens. Yes. Mm -hmm. Without it. You can. Yep. But you cannot evaluate anything about that fit without Correct. a topography. Correct. So I agree with you. I think it's a wise investment. You know? Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, absolutely. how about... How do you get your patients to understand the importance of purchasing their ortho K again the following year? Yeah, so, you know, that's the lens that they use every night that they sleep in. Um, so I really tell parents, hey, look, you know, this is something you have to replace every year. Um, and I really don't get a ton of pushback on that. Um, every once in a while, I will if the patient's been in ortho K, you know, for four or five, six years, and they have a ton of backup lenses, um, they may more or less get a little lazy with wanting to order them every year. Um, <laughs> but I think it's all about your education. So I just educate them. This is something you're using every single night. And it's really important in order to get the most effective treatment, you really need to replace the lenses every year. Um, the lenses can, um, you know, can naturally um, change shape a little bit um, over the course of the year. So in order to optimize your treatment, we need to make sure we're getting a new pair. Yeah, the reason we're replacing that lens is because they're gonna, the performance will be suboptimal as yep, the months absolutely. go on. So mm -hmm. why would yep. you want to keep it if you're not seeing as well or if you're not as comfortable? But right. um, yeah, now let's see here. Um, how important is environment versus heredity in myopia? Um, I mean, they, they, both, they both play a role. Um, you know, if it's somewhat somewhat unpredictable um, at times, you know, you've got ch uh, parents that are both myopic and then the child's not, or vice versa, you have a child that's, that's myopic um, and their parents are not. So, you know, they, they both play important roles. And I think that's why you need to assess the risk factors. Um, it's not not one or the other, it's, it's everything. You know, how much time does the child spend outdoors? Um, what, are the parents nearsighted? Are any of the other family members nearsighted? Um, what's the ethnicity of the child? So it, it all plays a role. Absolutely. There's not, not one, I think, more important factor. Now, this is an interesting question. Uh, they're asking if you could perhaps share a list of layman's terms use that you use when communicating with patients and parents so that may be something you know you could put together sure, and absolutely. you know we'll be mm -hmm. glad to put it up on our website yep. because i th i think your point was well taken as practitioners we often get kind of puffed up and you know we want to impress these parents with our fancy uh, clinical language mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. we lose them and they don't understand yes. what we're saying so sometimes it is really really critical that we use a more of a layman's term. Yeah, I, you know, so if you've got words here um, yes. mm -hmm. and you'd provide them, Kate, uh, I'll let the audience know, we'll be glad to, uh, you'll get an email, anybody who's participating, we can send that out to you and then uh, we'll post it up on euclidsystems.com here in the U.S. too. Okay, that's Absolutely. a great one. Sounds great, Jane. Yeah, we can okay. do that. Okay. How do you answer a parent saying, why should there be a difference between a broken retainer or a lost retainer lens? Why aren't both covered under the warranty? <laughs> you know, that's, that's, a, that's a great they, question. <laughs> they always want it all. <laughs> yes. I, I know, I know. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I wish it could be, right? Um, I, yeah. I wish that, um, but the problem is, you know, I, I think that, um, if, if we, that, that lens is lost, you know, well, what really happened to that lens? <laughs> um, but if it's broken, we can clearly see that it's broken. Yes, you cannot wear that lens. We will replace it. Um, and really the child should be responsible enough that they're not going to lose lens. It may happen. Um, things happen to all of us. 
Um, but that's why I think, um, as I mentioned, you need to make sure that when you're explaining that to parents, that they, that they know a lost lens is not covered. So it's important that when they're practicing their insertion or removal, they need to do it in a safe space in which they will not lose the lens. And so when we're going through insertion or removal training in our office, that's something we do. I say, hey, look, you got to have a setup like this so that you cannot drop the lens. You need to be leaning over a countertop table, something like that, so it does not get lost. Yeah, I think you, you made a very important point. You know, regardless of how much space you may or may not have, it can be a desk, it can be a kitchen table, it yep. can be, it can be you know, any, any small space, but mm -hmm. get a, a towel or some paper product down to where if that lens does fall, it won't bounce. You know, Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and lean over and get a mirror where you can lean to. I think those very simple steps uh, really, uh, accidents will happen once in a while, but I find lost lenses are really a small part of my practice, uh, you know, and, and usually yeah. a very mm -hmm. understandable. Yes, yeah. It doesn't, doesn't happen, I think, if, if, you, if you educate on how to prevent it. It doesn't, it doesn't happen too frequently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's another quick, great question uh, for those that are hanging on. Do you have them come in on that first appointment wearing the lenses for that mm. one-day follow? This has been a big debate in the U.S. Yeah, uh, many yeah. practitioners are saying, I, I, why do they need to be why do they need to be uncomfortable till they get there <laughs> when I don't care? I'm going to look at a topo. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, Jane, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, no, I, I do not want them coming in wearing their lenses. And I think you are exactly correct um, in that we want this to be a really positive experience. And it's not so positive <laughs> having them come in <laughs> cheering and, and blinking. Um, and also, Jane, um, you won't get a great topography or vision reading Exactly. That day. Mm -hmm. So if you really want a good topography, good vision reading, um, and a positive experience, um, I, I personally recommend absolutely do not wear the lenses into office. Bring do them, you try to see them. them? Do you try to see them, schedule them in the morning uh, yes. for that first visit or, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. you don't lose effect as the day goes on? Yeah. Correct. Yep. They are always um, my, one of my first couple appointments. So generally easily before 9 a.m. I will be seeing them. Mm-hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question about, do you have a particular lubricating drop you recommend for nighttime use? Um, you know. Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so part of it depends on what samples I have available in my office um, <laughs> <laughs> because I want to make sure I'm giving them something to get them started. Uh -huh. um, so I'm somewhat limited to what I have. Um, I, I really like um, the 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 blink, the the mild to, or the moderate blink, um, the the refresh um, uh, liquid gel can be another great one. Um, I so I like those slightly thicker lubricating drops. Um, you can also re use the refresh Opti preservative free. That's another great one. Um, Sustain Ultra works really well. Um, and then if the child is still having trouble uh, uh, adapting or if you're not getting the optimized results and everything's looking pretty good, um, I'll have them make sure they use like a liquid gel drop or something even thicker and that typically helps. Mm -hmm. uh, here's, a, here's one I didn't expect and, and I, I'm glad somebody asked it. Uh, the, your thoughts on fitting an early presbyope with myopia with just one lens to create a monovision? Yeah, I, you know what? Um, if you um, if you educate on the on the um, expectations, then sure, I I would do it. Um, mm -hmm. I would say absolutely. Um, let's let's give it a try. Um, I have had a couple parents do start ortho K with their child, um, which is yeah. always interesting. <laughs> um, that's kind of a fun little adventure you can have. Um, Sure, absolutely. Um, if, if they're enthusiastic, and we definitely have some patients at my practice that are enthusiastic about, um, you know, new technology, and absolutely, I'd, I'd give it a try. I, I always tell this story. One of my first patients in uh, way back in the 80s for the FDA approval study here in the U.S. is still wearing ortho -K today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and he is a presbyope now. And through the years, I just kept reducing the correction power. <laughs> and I finally just took out one lens. And he's just, don't forget the adults. We focus on myopia management. But ortho -K is a wonderful thing for dry eye adults, presbyopic adults. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. I, youngest yeah, Jane... youngest pa patient you ever fit? Um, in ortho K, um, six years old. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Atropine doses, do you, yeah, there's a lot of debate about that. What's your, what's yeah. Your <laughs> um, so atropine um, 0.01 and primarily because that's what I can get from my compounding pharmacy at the moment. So um, admittedly, I may prefer 0.02, but um, I'm limited to what I have available. So mm -hmm. more to come, uh, hopefully. Do you measure axial length as part of your myopia management? Um, at this time, at my private practice, um, no, I do not. Mm -hmm. I do not. Um, I would love to, um, but you know, you have to uh, invest in what you can. And right now, that that's not on the list of things I can invest in. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would love to. I think I think it would be great. Um, I would love to have that technology, but mm -hmm. um, right now, I'm, I'm unable. Yeah, it's it's kind of pricey. Yeah. Uh, it, here's the interesting. He's uh, this person says some practitioners ask the patient to not wear your lenses one day a week or once a month. Well, you've already said you stress every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. Every day. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Every day. Um, so certainly, you know, if, if the chi child's a little teen, I guess I should say, typically if they're in their teens or young adults, they may go a night or two without it. And you know, th mm -hmm. that, that's probably fine. Uh, but early on, once again, you need to set clear and explicit, um, expectations. So it's just a clear expectation. You have to wear it every night and you say, Oh, you might be able to go a night without then you'll get parents saying, well, they have to wear it every night. Yeah, then they'll well, yeah, they do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just set that expectation straight on. Um, yeah. But we all know that later on, you may be able to not. Exactly. Uh, do you think it's advisable for the parent to be the one doing the, uh, you know, putting the lenses in and taking them out for the child? Do you, you know. Um, I, I will allow it in certain, in certain circumstances, but I really um, want the child to be able to do it. So I always try um, to have the child do it all on their own. And I would say overwhelmingly um, have success with that. Um, but the parents are also educated. The parents are there too. The parents are helping. Um, but most of the time I prefer if the child can do it on their own, but I will let the parents help, especially if the child is younger. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I must say, I am constantly amazed how well children do. Oh, they do. When given they really this do. responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They really do. Mm -hmm. I think as parents, we always think our kids are incapable. But yeah. <laughs> uh, what you find out is they're quite capable with doing they this. Are. Do you have an, what's your thought about stopping ortho -K? We talked about adult use, but that's different. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming this is for myopia management. Mm -hmm. At what age mm -hmm. do you stop or what, what's your feeling about this? I, I like them to be in it um, as long as possible because, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a great way to correct their vision. Um, I, I find the most challenge is with my college age students. And, you know, those are the, the kids above the age of 18. And at that time, we can most likely stop the ortho K and, and hope that um, the myopia is done progressing. Um, and two, I just find that college students have a very unpredictable schedule, very unpredictable sleep schedule. So um, some of them are still successful in ortho K, but if they're going to discontinue, I find that that's generally when it happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, certainly. I try to always tell them, I, you know, I'd prefer you stay there till you're 18 or 20. Yep. But mm -hmm. I also know that it's difficult sometimes, and, and certainly yeah. with college mm -hmm. students and, and uh, graduate students, difficult. Mm -hmm. It is. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Kate, I want to thank you, Dr. McClure, again. You're welcome, Jane. For Absolutely. your time and your wonderful uh, expertise that you've given us. You know, I think many of us, you know, we spend our whole lives focused on clinical learning, and sometimes we stumble at the simpler thing, which is communicating. So I think this has been invaluable, and I hope, I think from the questions, you can see that the attendees, um, you know, we had well over 200 people on this call tonight. So I think Great, that gives really us an idea of how many people are anxious to get this kind of working knowledge. So again, I thank you. To all of you in the audience, I wanna thank you again for all of us at Euclid Systems. Uh, please, uh, on the screen is, uh, is David Bland, our Vice President of Sale, uh, our 1-800 number. You can go to our website, uh, you know, it's euclidsystems.com. And, uh, you know, please don't hesitate. Uh, my name is Jane. You can contact me, you know, contact David. We'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. And again, thank you. We know how hard it is to take time away from your families 
your your home and your work to attend these and we greatly appreciate it uh, we do plan to have another webinar towards the end of uh, July. I wish I had the dates, but I don't have them in front of me, but you'll be getting uh, emails and notifications. So again, Dr. McClure, thank you and good night. Thank you, Jane. Thank you.